Well, uh, Mr. Prime Minister, I'm delighted to see you, albeit from a very great distance indeed. I'm uh, here in the heartland of the United States. I'm, uh, I'm in Montana. And so uh, Greece is a long way away, uh, but I'm following closely what's been happening uh, in your country under your leadership. And it's a great honor and privilege to have the chance to catch up with you. The last I saw one another was at the World Economic Forum at Davos back in January. And I remember we discussed the possibility of a, a pandemic at a time when almost nobody at Davos was discussing it. And I wanted to begin by asking you, uh, what do you subsequently do? Because it's, it's pretty clear from the data that, that Greece reacted more quickly and more effectively to COVID-19 than almost any other European country. I want to just ask you to describe the weeks after Davos and how you thought about the problem and when exactly you, you took action. Well, first of all, it's uh, a pleasure to, to chat. I, much, I would much prefer to be uh, in Delphi um, uh, and have this discussion uh, in person, but I guess this is a new COVID reality and we still have to uh, adjust to it. Uh, and thank you for your, uh, for your question. And I do indeed remember very well the discussions we had in Davos uh, at the end of January when uh, COVID-19 wasn't really on the radar. Uh, of, uh, uh, of the public discourse. It was not a topic that was discussed in great detail uh, at Davos, but uh, the, the warning lights were uh, already flashing. And I guess as far as Greece was concerned, um, we had uh, the benefit uh, of seeing what was already happening uh, in Italy. And at some point, uh, we had a choice between uh, waiting to collect more data and, and maybe have more clarity uh, or take a decision earlier. And we decided to take uh, the basic decisions regarding lockdown earlier rather than later. And it proved to be uh, the right choice. Of course, you never know what would have happened had you reacted in a different way. But the evidence seems pretty clear. Countries that reacted quickly, aggressively, and with a very clear message uh, managed to uh, impose uh, social distancing uh, in, in practice and convince their population that this was the right approach to take, uh, eventually did better uh, in, uh, in containing uh, the, the first phase of the, uh, of the epidemic. As you know, epidemic is also um, a Greek word. Um, uh, uh, epi means on, and uh, demic means, refers to the demos, the people. Um, uh, uh, and uh, uh, we, uh, what, we, what, what we did when I first spoke uh, to, to my public health uh, experts and I, and I listened to, to their advice, I had, uh, again, a, a choice between thinking about you know, the economic fallout and the economic impact of what we were about uh, to do, uh, or protect uh, uh, human lives, uh, everyone who's living in Greece, Greeks, uh, but also our, you know, our refugee population, which by definition were more vulnerable. On top of that, uh, I knew that we had a battered healthcare system, a relatively old population, so it was not that we were dealt a, a great opening hand at the beginning of this pandemic. And this um, may convince me that I needed to react sooner rather than later. And uh, as far as the economic uh, fallout is, is concerned, uh, I think maybe the people who reasoned uh, against lockdowns uh, because they wanted to preserve economic activity, I think they got the causality wrong. I think it's those countries that did well in containing the epidemic, uh, at least in its early stage, that will emerge stronger uh, as we enter the, uh, the recovery phase. So it was a very difficult uh, period for us. Um, uh, it, uh, it came right after we had to deal with another geopolitical crisis, and I'm referring to the effort by Turkey to push tens of thousands of migrants across our frontier uh, in northern Greece, which we managed to deal with very effectively by sealing our border, protecting Greece's borders, but also Europe's borders. So I was forced to deal with two sort of very complicated crisis uh, in, in, in a short period of time. But uh, right now, I, I can tell you, 
uh, that I'm, I'm quite happy with, with how, we, how we reacted, very proud of the way the Greek people reacted, um, uh, and very, very proud that we actually got people on board. Uh, we didn't coerce them into, doing, in, into, into changing their behavior, we convinced them. Um, uh, and in a country that had its history, as you know, over the past decade of, civil, of some civil unrest, it was very important that all this happened extremely peacefully, very little conspiracy theory um, uh, uh, you know, floating around. Uh, everyone was convinced that this was the right thing to do. And one of the reasons why I think we succeeded was because we gave the experts the floor and we let them do the talking and we depoliticized essentially what is a public health crisis. Well, I'm sure your uh, Greek audience is familiar with the, the data, but just for any non-Greek uh, listeners or viewers, it's worth noting that with just over 3,000 cases, 183 deaths, and around 1,300 people regarded as recovered, Greece really has exceptional uh, statistics from the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. And uh, it compares favorably, uh, even with Germany, which has generally had a good write-up. If you look at the cases uh, per million data. I think Germany even today has uh, uh, seven times higher a rate of, of cases in relation to the population. And when you look at the, the, the mortality relative to population, uh, Greece is just uh, a quite exceptional success story. And I don't think anybody should underestimate how difficult those decisions were early on before it was really clear the correct uh, response, as all the epidemiologists I respect have long argued, is early action. And those countries that decided on the opposite course, which includes the United States and the United Kingdom, have paid an extremely heavy price in terms of, of excess mortality. Uh, of course, you can't really talk about uh, this pandemic as if, as if it's over. Uh, most pandemics historically uh, last years two years uh, in the case of most modern pandemics. Uh, so I wanted to, to now look forward and, and ask how you're thinking about reopening, returning uh, life to normal, and what measures, what precautions you have in place to deal with any new outbreaks. Uh, first of all, we've started um, gradually reopening uh, our economy, um, and we've done so over the past month. Uh, so far, uh, it has been uh, relatively successful, with one exception of a small, very regional outbreak uh, in uh, north um, uh, eastern Greece, which I think we have managed to, uh, to contain. Uh, we haven't seen any significant uh, uptake in, in the number of new, uh, of new cases uh, and the number of people in our ICU beds, which in my mind, is probably the most important indicator because all countries have different testing strategies. What we need to look at is really mortality and the number of people that are actually hospitalized from COVID. It, it keeps going down. I think we have uh, maybe 13 or 14 people across the country in total uh, in ICU beds from COVID. So even uh, during the most difficult weeks, we didn't even come close to reaching full capacity when it comes to our public health care system. Uh, and that was, again, the, the measure of our, of our success. So what do we do? You know, we gradually um, uh, open up. You know, uh, economic activity has gone back more or less um, uh, to normal uh, in Greece, but we still need to keep basic precautions. Uh, and social distancing rules are here to stay. You're right to point out the pandemic has not been defeated. And I won't, uh, I, I won't get tired telling uh, you know, uh, Greek people that we should not be the victims of our success. We shouldn't relax too much. We still need to be careful, wear masks whenever, uh, wherever the experts tell us that we need to wear masks in public transport uh, or in places where we uh, have to be, uh, by definition, we are in, uh, in close uh, uh, contact, still take care of, uh, of vulnerable people and still make sure that we get the contact tracing right. We did an exceptionally good job in contact tracing uh, in, uh, in Greece because we managed to keep the numbers low. You can do all that if you have small numbers. If the, the pandemic you know, breaks out um, of, uh, of the small circles that you can contain, then all this becomes uh, extremely difficult and extremely complicated. But of course, for us, 
and I'm sure you want to ask about that uh, in our discussion, the, the next big challenge is tourism. How do we open up and how do we make uh, the success story of, of dealing with the first wave of the pandemic a success story of opening up the country to tourists, but with rules um, and uh, with, with their protection and their health as our number one priority. And with, of course, you know, protecting the local population, in particular, the staff that is actually uh, working uh, in the hospitality business. And I think we have a, a very well you know, thought out plan. I will be uh, in Santorini uh, on Saturday um, uh, to sort of launch uh, uh, what is going to be a different um, uh, tourism uh, season, but we still uh, expect you know, a fair number of travelers to travel to Greece, uh, especially after July 1st, when we will be relaxing most of our most of our measures. So just to dig a bit deeper into that, uh, how are you going to manage the, the reality that a great many people who come to Greece for a holiday uh, this summer will be coming from countries that did not handle uh, COVID-19 so successfully and where uh, infection rates are uh, significantly higher. Uh, will tourists be uh, tested on arrival? Uh, are you going to have some kind of uh, quarantine in place? Uh, I certainly know that in some Asian countries, the measures are pretty strict for uh, people coming in from abroad. It takes a very long time, uh, for example, to get into Hong Kong these days. So what exactly will happen and how should tourists considering a, a trip to Greece prepare themselves for their arrival? Well, first of all, we're doing everything in phases. Uh, right now, I, I need to point out that you can uh, fly into uh, into Greece. There are a few countries where we've limited, uh, where we've, we, we don't allow flights. But everyone who flies into Athens, which is the only airport that right now accepts international flights, uh, is, is tested. Uh, everyone. Uh, everyone has to stay one night uh, in a hotel provided by the Greek state. Uh, and, uh, you know, the day after, uh, once the tests come out, and overwhelmingly the, the tests are negative, we've had very, very few positive um, uh, cases from people traveling into Greece, they're free to go uh, and, and move around the country. Uh, we're going to be moving into phase two, which is essentially the two weeks between June 15th and June 30th. Um, where we will allow flights into Athens uh, and uh, Thessaloniki from, from more countries. And essentially there, um, we are dividing the countries based on a list of airports that was provided by the European authorities into sort of higher risk and lower risk countries. We'll be testing more people from higher risk uh, uh, countries. And then as we move into the main phase of opening up, uh, as of July 1st, we expect to be fully in line um, uh, with uh, European directions, which means we want to open up travel to the European Union uh, and the Schengen countries by, uh, by July 1st. And there we will be doing targeted random testing because, of course, it is very difficult to test, uh, to test everyone uh, using a very complicated but I think well-developed algorithm that takes in place um, epidemiological data from all countries. And, of course, by then there still will be some countries where we will not allow visitors to come. Uh, I expect um, uh, the UK to be on that list still by then. Um, talking to the United Kingdom, maybe we can establish at some point after July 15th um, uh, safe corridors uh, that will uh, allow for some traveling from the UK um, uh, to take place. But uh, for the European Union, um, we will be open to welcome uh, tourists um, as of, of July 1st. But of course, we will do it in a very different way. There will be social distancing uh, at our hotels. You will still be able to get a full um, Greek experience. But for example, we encourage people to be outside. Uh, this is very important for us because we know uh, that the transmission rates outside are a fraction of the transmission rates inside. So we want to push people to be outside, which is actually quite easy to do in Greece. But of course, um, encouraging people to travel to Greece and put them in a quarantine while they travel to Greece sort of def defeats the purpose. Um, so I think we need to strike a right balance. We have all the infrastructure in place to deal, uh, God forbid, with any sort of small um, um, uh, regional outbreak. Um, uh, we've uh, ramped up our testing capacity. Uh, we have, you know, infrastructure in our in our hospitals uh, in our islands, and there will be, you know, some small islands which accepted a small number of charter flights, which will not be open to direct charter flights because we, we need to be sure that wherever we accept tourists, we have the necessary infrastructure to do the random testing, but also the hospital uh, or primary care infrastructure to, to deal with uh, any, uh, any unforeseen case. So we know we will have a fraction of tourists. 
um, compared, to, we, we were getting 33 million tourists a year. We know it's going to be a fraction of that, um, uh, but still, uh, we want to save whatever we can, but we want to do it safely. Um, uh, and we will monitor the data um, uh, very carefully. And there's always a big disclaimer, Niall, and I want to be very honest about that. If there's any change, we're always free to change our approach. Um, um, uh, if things in a country um, uh, turn out towards the worse, we will be, of course, we always reserve the right um, uh, to change our uh, approach because the last thing we want is to endanger people who travel, but also to uh, endanger you know, the, the Greek population, especially people who work in the hospitality um, uh, sector. Uh, I should also add, and we, we, didn't, we didn't discuss it, that we, we have put in place a very uh, and, and maybe we want to jump into that in the, as, as the discussion continues. Uh, this is not just about dealing with the pandemic, it's also dealing with the economic fallout from the pandemic and what do we do on, uh, on that front. And this is not just about tourism, it's about the overall uh, economy. And I'm happy if you have questions on that to talk about the economic measures that, that we've taken. That is exactly what I want to ask you next. The OECD just published uh, some projections which were notably more pessimistic than the IMFs uh, back in April. It looks as if uh, in the second quarter of the Greek economy could contract by as much as 45%, which is a pretty stunning number, but it'll bounce back in the third quarter by as much as 33%. Big question the OECD is asking is what, what will happen if there are second waves, not just in Greece, but I think let's talk more generally about Europe and the world. And in the scenario of second waves, you could actually have a contraction again in the fourth quarter. Now for Greece, which has had a, an economic battering uh, over the past decade, as you know only too well, this is uh, another very heavy hammer blow. And because of Greece's reliance on tourism uh, and, uh, and hospitality as a sector of the economy, it's, it's hitting Greece pretty hard. So uh, let's talk a little bit about that economic shock and, and what you're able to do to offset it. Unlike some countries, Greece doesn't have a great deal of policy room for maneuver. It can't do, for, for example, what the United States has done, which is a massive monetary and, and fiscal effort to offset the shock. Uh, so it, in some ways, you, you're in one of the tightest economic spots of any country because you can't, in fact, uh, ramp up your deficit and you can't have an independent monetary policy. Tell us a little bit about dealing with the biggest economic shock since the Great Depression with almost no policy levers that you can pull. Well, first of all, we have today we have more policy levers than we had six months ago. And, and let me explain why. First of all, we managed um, uh, to make sure that uh, Greek bonds are uh, included uh, in the bond purchasing program uh, of, the, of the ECB. That was not the case um, uh, until, until very recently. Uh, also, uh, as you know, uh, there are exceptions which also apply to, to Greece um, uh, regarding uh, fiscal rules for 2020. And I do expect that those exceptions are probably go also going to um, be put in place for 2021. You remember we've had these discussions. Greece was forced to produce a very high primary surplus of 3.5%. This is no longer the case. So we will be running uh, a, a deficit, as most countries will be, because we need to support uh, the real economy. So, uh, And uh, we've also been able um, uh, to regularly tap the international capital markets and to replenish our cash buffer. Um, and we've actually done so uh, at very reasonable terms. We issued a 10-year bond uh, a few days ago, heavily oversubscribed um, uh, with, a, with, a, with uh, uh, you know, a coupon of 1.5%, a yield of 1.55%, um, uh, very, uh, very attractive um, um, given the context uh, and the legacy uh, of, uh, of the Greek crisis. So the markets, so I think trust this, uh, uh, th this government, and I think they understand that under these conditions, there needs to be a lot of government spending to support the real economy and in particular to support jobs. And we need to spend the money wisely and we've done so. We've put in place you know, a, a huge, by Greek standards, or I would say a very big, uh, huge is probably, an, uh, but certainly a very big stimulus program, 14 billion in fiscal measures and 10 billion in, uh, in guarantees. Uh, and our main goal has been 
to support employment. Um, and I think we reacted very quickly to support the real economy. Essentially, we've picked up um, a significant amount of the wage bill of private companies that were forced to, to close down uh, during, um, during the crisis. Uh, we provided uh, companies with uh, state-funded liquidity. Um, we've given banks guarantees um, uh, to borrow money to companies on relatively favorable terms because we understand liquidity uh, is a huge issue. We've pushed tax obligations uh, into, into the future. So we're very concerned with liquidity, liquidity of households, liquidity of, uh, uh, of, of companies. And if you look at the numbers, uh, everyone was predicting you know, a, a, a Greek uh, disaster. If you look at at least the numbers from the first quarter, they've been in the midst of what is a, a huge crisis, relatively encouraging, only 0.9% recession, when the, when the Eurozone average uh, is 3.6%. Uh, what does this tell me? That the Greek economy entered the crisis with a lot of momentum, which we know was actually the case because we were doing rather well before the crisis hit us. So there was momentum, um, and, and of course, uh, March was not as disastrous as many people thought it would be. Of course, the second quarter is going to be very, very uh, difficult. We don't uh, have the exact numbers, uh, exact numbers yet. But we intervened very quickly to, to make the shock uh, uh, as uh, 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 less painful than it would have been had we not uh, intervened. And of course, now we've also put in place um, flexible working uh, arrangements. This is very important, especially for um, uh, for tourism, uh, similar schemes exist in many countries. Germany has been um, the leader in these types of, uh, of schemes where someone um, um, we give the flexibility to the employer to employ someone only, let's say, for 15 days out of 30. We pay them almost their full wage. We also cover their social security contributions. This gives uh, uh, companies, especially hotels, the flexibility to open with more staff, use them for less amount of time because they don't have you know, as much, as much work to do, but while at the same time um, uh, protecting um, uh, jobs, which should be uh, our, uh, our number one priority. So we intend to put in place what we call this bridge program until September, October, when we will have more visibility in terms of what, uh, what we can do. So we are um, spending a lot of money to support the real economy, but we are aware of the fact that we have a big legacy, we have a big public debt, uh, and unlike what you know, the oppositioning is encourage us, encouraging us, which is to spend like there is no tomorrow, we want to leave some ammunition uh, available because we don't know when this crisis is going to end. Uh, and of course, although the, and I'm sure we'll discuss this um, uh, uh, as the discussion goes on, the European proposal has been very ambitious and very bold. It hasn't been finalized yet. So we cannot spend money that we don't yet have. Um, we first need to finalize of the European proposal, have it signed and sealed and approved by the Council, and then we will know exactly uh, how much room we have uh, to maneuver and how much additional fiscal space uh, we can use to support the economy during this very difficult period. I wonder if, uh, in common with some people here in the United States, uh, you're asking yourself, is my future perhaps not in 2021, but maybe in 2022, going to be another debt crisis, given the enormous amounts of government borrowing that are going on. Right now, we're all focused on the public health emergency and the, the need to keep the economy from imploding, but it, it does imply uh, an even higher Greek debt uh, tomorrow, as you say. So how do you think about that? Or is it something you just don't think about right now? Because your focus is entirely on the on the problems of 2020. I think we will be moving towards a world where we will need to accept the fact that there will be more debt. The question is on whose balance sheet, and that is why the discussion um, um, uh, within the European Union is so important, and that is why we've made the argument which uh, the Commission, but also the big countries, France, Germany, accepted in principle, is that you need to support the economies that were hit and that are also have a legacy of debt through grants and not through additional loans. And this is the direction of the proposal of the Commission, which I think is absolutely right. The Commission has put forward a very ambitious proposal. It has put its money where its mouth is. Uh, it includes a significant amount of, of, of grants. 
um, to support countries that have been that have been hit, and a, a mechanism for the Commission itself um, to issue debt at the European level. So the question is, um, where is the debt actually going to be issued? Now, the Greek debt has certain peculiarities. It is uh, quite big as a percent of the GDP, but with relatively debt repayment obligations until 2032. Uh, and of course, as long as interest rates stay low, and I do expect them to stay low for the foreseeable uh, future, and I expect central banks um, uh, to keep interest rates low and to keep on supporting the system and the banking system with additional uh, liquidity. I don't think this is uh, a, a sort of a, a question that needs to be uh, addressed urgently. But in order for this to happen, we need to make sure as, as a European Union that we go down the path that the Commission has proposed, which means uh, 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 the ability to issue debt at the Commission level and to support uh, member states primarily through grants uh, uh, and not through loans, provided, of course, that these grants will be used in a wise manner. They will not be spent uh, on uh, necessarily on, on handouts and on subsidies, but they will be used to actually make our uh, economies more resilient and more competitive. Uh, and this is what we intend to do. The initial allocation uh, by, uh, by, by the Commission plan envisions uh, a, a, an additional fiscal support on top of what we will be getting as a result of the multi-annual financial framework that is around 32 billion. I don't know if that is going to be a final number, but it's certainly a very, very big number, uh, which forces us to think creatively how we will use this money, how we will invest it into transforming the economy, how this money is going to be used to feed into our uh, main agenda of green transformation, of digital transformation, um, uh, of making sure that our um, uh, workforce has the right skills to adapt to uh, the digital economy. So we want to use this additional uh, funding to make sure that we drive through uh, an ambitious uh, reform program. And of course, at the same time, you know, stay faithful to our main uh, uh, plan, which is a plan of gradually reducing taxes and social security contributions to make our economy more competitive. So this is a big uh, opportunity for Greece, but we need to make sure that we convince the, you know, some European countries that this is the right approach, not just for Greece or for Italy, for Spain, but for Europe as a whole. Because now well, if we don't move down that direction, then the threat to the, uh, to the single market uh, is going to be profound. And it's those countries, smaller, more advanced countries, that uh, primarily benefit uh, from the single market. And in a globalized uh, economy, um, we're all dependent on, uh, on each other. So uh, I think this proposal, it's imperative that it's approved by, uh, by the Council, more or less as, uh, uh, as it is. Uh, and uh, that will send a very clear signal that the European Union as a whole uh, is taking control of a very difficult situation and, and is using also its fiscal power, not just the monetary power of the ECB, um, uh, to address what is, as you pointed out rightly, an unprecedented crisis, something we've never seen um, uh, before in our lifetimes and hopefully we'll never see again. I want to talk about the European politics a little bit because uh, while it can seem as if uh, the European Commission's work is rather bureaucratic. In truth, there's been considerable drama uh, within the European Union since uh, the pandemic struck. It seemed for a time as if it would be, to use a French phrase, sauve qui peut, every country for itself. And certainly in neighboring Italy, there was a good deal of ill feeling when it seemed that uh, Germany and other countries were prioritizing their own health needs uh, over their neighbors' needs. Now, that didn't uh, arise in the case of Greece for reasons we've discussed, but you've obviously had a, a ringside seat, uh, a seat actually on stage as these political dramas have unfolded. And maybe I can ask you to, to tell me if I'm right when I say that there was a huge shift in attitudes, particularly in Germany, uh, that led uh, from this initial crisis period to the very bold proposal that the Commission now uh, has come up with, which I think most of us regard as the uh, Macron-Merkel plan, and which looks very likely to be passed because the frugal four are, I think, down to a frugal two at this point. So I guess I'm interested to know if I'm right in thinking that something big changed in Germany 
because certainly from a Greek vantage point, this is a very different Angela Merkel from the Angela Merkel of the global financial crisis. And it's certainly a very, literally, it's a German, different German finance minister because Wolfgang Schäuble is no longer in that position. A lot, Olaf Scholz is. You've, you've been involved in these discussions and uh, obviously you can't breach confidence, but I think you can help us understand what exactly changed in Berlin and, and why. Uh, my chief economic advisor reminded me that 10 years ago exactly to the date, Newsweek, which was still uh, published in print edition uh, you know, at the time, had a photo with uh, someone throwing a firebomb in Athens with the title was the end of the euro. Uh, the euro didn't end, um, thank God. And this crisis is very different from the crisis of 2010. And there's no moral element in this crisis. There are no good guys or no bad guys. Um, um, there's no one who sort of uh, benefited from the benevolence of others to take advantage uh, of, of what they're doing here. It's, it's, a, it's a symmetric uh, shock that affects everyone. And that, I think, to a certain extent, affected um, uh, Germany's, um, uh, Germany's thinking because um, everyone realized that they're not immune to this, uh, to this crisis. And the preservation of the single market, especially for countries which are very much export dependent, is of, is of paramount uh, importance. And uh, I have great respect for, you know, for, for, for Angela Merkel. And I think uh, um, she, um, uh, in, in accepting and, and coming up with this French-German proposal, which is you know, the, the, uh, at the, the foundation of also what the Commission has proposed, I think she uh, is taking Germany uh, in the right direction. But the discourse today is very different from the discourse uh, 10 years uh, ago. And I think we all realize what I told you before, it is in our self-interest uh, as a properly functioning internal market to preserve um, the, the, the internal market, strengthen it and making sure that there are no weak links. Because if there are weak links, we all remember what can uh, happen because it has happened once. And we, we stirred into the abyss, we stirred into the precipice back in 2015. To a great extent, that was the fault of the previous government that pushed us to that point until it made uh, you know, a spectacular uh, U-turn, but it still cost us you know, three years in terms of lost uh, uh, growth. But the narrative today uh, is, is, is also very, uh, very different. But there's also uh, an argument to be made about us, especially I have to speak for, only from a Greek perspective, I can't speak for, my other, for the other southern neighbors, that we still need to, to convince those who are you know, slightly skeptical about giving us money in the form of grants, that these grants will be used wisely, um, uh, that this is an opportunity um, uh, to actually transform the economy. Greece has been a recipient of EU grants for the past uh, 40 years. We have not always, I'll be very honest with you, we have not always used this money um, um, in the best possible way, and we need to change that. That's why, you know, once the, the plan is approved, we will place a lot of emphasis on the proper governance of how we're actually going to use this money, make sure um, uh, that it's, it's done in full transparency with accountability, but also with taking into consideration the long-term uh, perspective of how we actually transform the competitiveness and strengthen the competitiveness of the, uh, the economy. So I think um, when we discuss at the Council, a lot of it also has to do with you know, personal credibility. Greece is strengthened, is, is coming stronger out of this crisis. Uh, it was a surprise story. No one was expecting Greece to do that well. I think the brand of the country has been strengthened. A lot of reforms were pushed through during the crisis. It is surprising how quickly the digital transformation of the state actually took place. How many more services are offered online? We did in weeks things that hadn't happened for years. And people suddenly realize, whoa, we don't necessarily have to visit the Greek public administration. We can do things online, which are maybe obvious in other countries and now they're happening uh, in Greece. So the crisis as a catalyst for change, but also the crisis as an opportunity to rebuild trust in our institutions, in our democracy, in our political system, is extremely important. Greeks trust the state again. Um, I don't remember that in my political lifetime. There was always a lot of distrust uh, as to what, uh, you know, uh, what the state can do. And there's also a case to be made, uh, which is interesting because you know, I come from a liberal background, but I fully recognize that there are times when countries need to have their Keynesian moment. 
and they need to spend, and the state needs to be present. And when the state needs to be present, it needs to be present forcefully and effectively, which is, I think, what we, what we have to a certain extent um, uh, done uh, so far. Uh, and we've also had the benefit of being you know, a medium-sized, relatively centralized country. We didn't have any real problems with our region. So we managed to actually, in a crisis, having running a tight ship through a, you know, a strong center of government uh, is actually a, um, a, a, a big plus. So uh, coming back to the original question, I think the narrative is changing uh, in, uh, in Germany. And I do give uh, uh, Angela Merkel a lot of personal credit um, uh, for, uh, for this. And I think there's a better understanding of, of the global dynamic and for the need of the European Union to do something big. I don't know if it's a Hamiltonian moment or whatever we want to call it, but it is something big. We shouldn't underestimate what has been done um, uh, and what has been put forward. It is an ambitious, very ambitious proposal, and I hope it will be ratified sooner or later. I would hope sooner by the Council. I can't help uh, uh, asking if Britain's departure from the European negotiations has made it easier to have this Hamiltonian moment. Uh, th this is a sort of uh, footnote in a way because Brexit is no longer the uh, consuming preoccupation of, of European politics. But it occurs to me that if, if Britain was still in the room, it probably wouldn't be helping in the direction of uh, fiscal integration and that, that Hamiltonian moment. That, that's an allusion, in case anyone is wondering, to, to Alexander Hamilton, the first American Treasury Secretary who who created a sort of mutualization of the debts of the founding American states. I'm not sure if Europe is quite there, but I'm pretty sure that if Britain was still in the European Union, it would be about the least enthusiastic uh, member with respect to that kind of fiscal integration. Do you miss Britain? Well, uh, I was always uh, a fervent supporter of the idea that Britain belongs within the European Union. Uh, I wasn't, you know, I'm relatively new to the council, so I hadn't the chance to interact with, you know, British prime ministers at the level of the, uh, of the council. Only had one interaction with, um, uh, with, uh, with, with Boris uh, Johnson at the, at, at the level of the council. So it, it is a hypothetical question. I don't know, um, uh, you know, how the United Kingdom uh, would have reacted uh, in these negotiations. I know that in previous budget negotiations, if you look back to 2014, uh, it was uh, difficult to agree uh, uh, a budget, but uh, it, is a, it is a hypothetical question. I think what we need to, what we need to do is to agree, you know, phase two of Brexit. Uh, I don't know if we can keep our timetables. I'm concerned, um, uh, given the fact that a lot of our focus now is, uh, is, is on COVID. Uh, um, uh, but again, it's up to the British government to decide whether they want to ask for any sort of uh, uh, extension to the uh, to the negotiation, I, you know, I'd go with the second best option, which is, you know, an honest, um, you know, um, uh, relationship with the United Kingdom that is going to be fair to all parties involved. And there's no doubt that the European Union will continue to negotiate with the United Kingdom as one. Um, uh, and uh, that's something we have succeeded in doing, and we will continue to do so. Can I use the remaining five minutes that we have to turn to the global geopolitical questions of our time. You've already alluded to uh, the, the political or geopolitical crisis that, that already confronted you over Turkey's uh, uh, treatment of refugees uh, earlier. And I wanted to come back to that in just a moment. But if I take a step back and, and look at the, the world in, in mid 2020, I'm very struck by the fact that what I called Cold War II last year between the United States and China has only intensified during the pandemic on a whole range of, of issues. And it doesn't feel like a, a world in which international order is functioning terribly well. The World Health Organization doesn't seem to have covered itself in glory to the point that President Trump intends to withdraw from it. Henry Kissinger, whose biography I am in the midst of writing, wrote an interesting op-ed a few uh, weeks ago arguing that, uh, that there was a fundamental crisis of, of world order that we confronted. From the vantage point of the, of, uh, of the Greek prime minister, does it feel like uh, 
a world disorder? And, and what does that imply for Greece? Because Greece has to worry about more than just the other European Union member states. It has to think about uh, a pretty uh, unstable neighborhood uh, to the east and to the south. First of all, I, I agree with your assessment. Uh, you know, the world order as it was sort of put in place after World War II, and I think served overall the world, um, you know, pretty well and had at its foundation, you know, a, you know, a strong transatlantic um, alliance is certainly under pressure. I think this intensifies the, and makes the European Union much more relevant. And that is why I focus so much on, on making sure that we speak as one when, when it comes to the European Union, both on the economic front, but also on the geopolitical front. And that is why it's important uh, to speak with one voice when it comes to the big geopolitical questions regarding our neighborhood. Uh, you know that our relationship with Turkey has been difficult. And Turkey has been extremely provocative uh, in its activities uh, over um, um, the past uh, months, especially when it comes to signing what we consider to be a null and void uh, agreement with Libya uh, regarding the delimitation of maritime zones. You just have to take a look at the map to understand why this agreement doesn't make any sense what, what's, whatsoever. Uh, we, on the other hand, as Greece signed uh, an agreement with Italy regarding the delimitation of our maritime zones with full respect to international law and the United Nations Conventions on the Law of the Seas. That is the way we solve our problems in our neighborhood. And hopefully, we can convince everyone that this is a way to, to, to behave and not through unilateral uh, aggressive moves. Uh, but uh, when it comes to our relationship with Turkey, it is not just a Greek-Turkish problem. It's an EU-Turkey problem. Uh, Greece is a member of the European Union. Our security concerns are also the security concerns of the Union. When we're guarding our borders and when we're protecting our borders, we are protecting the borders of the European Union. I should remind you that when the crisis struck in the beginning of March, when we had this attempt uh, of uh, uh, refugees and migrants under the guidance of Turkey, uh, with the encouragement of the Turkish government to cross into Greece, uh, and we, we succeeded in protecting our borders. Two days later, the leadership of the European Union showed up uh, at our northeastern borders as an indication of, uh, of solidarity. So this is not just about Greek-Turkish uh, differences. It's about the whole context uh, of uh, the relationship between um, uh, the European Union and Turkey. And uh, if, uh, uh, if, if Turkey uh, uh, you know, th is thinking about violating sovereign rights of the Hellenic Republic, not only will it get a response from Greece, I am pretty sure it will also get a response um, uh, from, uh, from Europe. I don't, this is not the, you know, the, the path which I would, I would like to, um, uh, to take, but everyone needs to be aware uh, that um, uh, there will be you know, severe consequences should that, um, um, uh, should that happen. Now, on the other hand, we're always open to to talk with, um, um, with Turkey uh, on the main issue which we have on the table, which is a question of the delimitation of our maritime zones. And as I've said, um, uh, we, need to, we can have an honest discussion. And if we, if we finally uh, agree to disagree, um, uh, there are always ways of taking this issue to international court uh, in The Hague um, uh, under a common agreement of how we can resolve this issue, but always with full respect to international law. This is not a time for gunboat diplomacy. Um, uh, this sort of logic belongs to a different uh, um, um, uh, century, and that's not the way to solve problems in our neighborhood and to have good neighborly relations, which I fundamentally believe Greece and Turkey should have. I mean, we're destined by, by geography to live together. We have, you know, we, we have you know, common, um, uh, common interests. I mean, the relationship shouldn't be uh, as, as tense as it is now, but it is not, uh, I'm absolutely convinced that it's not our fault. You haven't mentioned NATO uh, and, and, uh, other than obliquely when you mentioned the transatlantic alliance, and yet it complicates life that the Greece and Turkey are also members of NATO. It seems a while ago now, but it isn't that long ago that President Macron described NATO in rather inflammatory terms as, as brain dead. Uh, is that how NATO strikes you, or does it still have a meaningful role to play in, in international order? I wouldn't uh, share that uh, uh, assessment. I think it was, it was certainly 
If it was a wake-up call, it certainly served its purpose, but I wouldn't agree with that, uh, uh, with that assessment. Uh, uh, I think NATO is an important pillar of the transatlantic relationship, but frankly, um, NATO, Greece and Turkey are NATO allies, and we have problems with each other. And that is an issue for us as being you know, part uh, uh, of, the, uh, of the alliance. And I've also made it um, uh, very, uh, very clear to the NATO leadership that you know, distancing, ourselves, distancing itself from the problem uh, is not always um, uh, the best approach when you have a country that is clearly behaving uh, in an aggressive manner and another NATO ally, because we are allies within NATO, uh, defending its, uh, uh, its national interests. So there's, there's some soul searching that needs to take place um, uh, within NATO regarding the future um, uh, uh, of, the, uh, uh, of, of the alliance, but the operational capabilities and the historical weight of uh, uh, of NATO and everything it has been, uh, everything it has achieved, cannot be discarded that easily. Well, I think we're rapidly running out of time, and I don't want to overrun, uh, as I'm sure you have uh, a packed uh, schedule as always. I must say, I I struggle to imagine how one does the job of prime minister in the midst of a of a pandemic. It must be tremendously difficult to do things virtually that you that you normally do in in the the same space and same time as your your colleagues uh, i guess it m maybe isn't so surprising that that greece has handled the pandemic as as well as as it has after all i was reading thucydides just the other day on this subject greece has been grappling with the problems of plague since the days of of, of pericles uh, the the heyday of Athenian democracy. Uh, so you have some experience with this, maybe a bit more than, than we in the United States, to, to put it mildly. Uh, le let me uh, just conclude this uh, with, with a final personal question. Uh, how is uh, the pandemic affecting you as, a, as an individual, as a, as a family? Some people find it extremely exhausting. There has been a huge explosion of frustration in the United States which I think has as much to do with being cooped up for two months as it has with any of the questions that people have taken the streets to, to protest about. How, how has, has COVID-19 affected your life uh, in this high pressure position, which normally would involve you in meeting dozens and dozens of people every day? How, how's it affected you? How's it affected your family? Let, let's wrap on a personal note. Well, thank you for making the reference to um, Thucydides, I uh, like to, when I look at, read the story, I like to forget that actually Pericles died as a result of the, uh, uh, of the plague. So um, we, we leave that. Uh, I wasn't going to bring that up. Yeah, uh, we leave that dim dimension of the story. Um, uh, uh, and, uh, uh, but when it comes to, um, uh, it's, been, it's been a struggle. Uh, of course, we, we try to work virtually, uh, but at the end of the day, we have to work. Um, so, um, and we have to at least have minimum interaction with, uh, with my team, with, with, with my ministers during the, um, uh, the pandemic. I found myself that, um, you know, the, the fact that we did a lot of work virtually organized my time slightly better. Uh, meetings were on time and they never ran beyond the scheduled time. So I think there is some value uh, in, in doing some of the work um, uh, remotely. Uh, but certainly there's a lot of pressure, uh, and it certainly um, made me, you know, reevaluate also my personal um, uh, priorities uh, to a certain uh, extent. Uh, and uh, I think the, the big lesson I learned is how do you take quick decisions under extreme pressure and with limited information. So you get as much information as you can, uh, but you're never going to be fully sure. If you wait to be fully sure, you won't take any decisions. And at some point, you have to trust the data and your instinct uh, and to do what, what you think is, uh, uh, is right. On a personal level, I can tell you it was actually a rather reinvigorating experience uh, in the sense that uh, my kids came back from, from abroad, two of them at least. So we spent three months all together had dinner every night or whenever I was able to make it for, um, um, uh, for, for dinner uh, home. And we actually got closer uh, as a family. Uh, and um, uh, so in that sense, uh, 
uh, it was it was good, and you know, family was you know big support as you can only interact with your family. You couldn't even interact with your friends. Uh, that was very very uh, important. But I think also in terms of the collective mood, uh, I think um, um, uh, success breeds optimism and vice versa. People felt proud again that we managed to do something which a lot of people thought was um, important, remarkable, or at least successful. And that made people feel better. Um, uh, so if you look at surveys now, even people understand that we're faced with a huge economic crisis, but there's still a degree of optimism, which I think comes out of the fact that we defied expectations and we felt proud again. As you know, pride is important, um, very important in terms of collective uh, identity. And of course, you know, even during the very difficult uh, days, um, you know, there's a stress, there's waking up every morning, you know, at six o'clock in the afternoon, you get the data regarding the infections. And at six o'clock in the morning, you get the data regarding what's happening on the migration front. Um, so this is a constant, um, you know, cycle of, of things uh, happening, and uh, you have to deal with a lot of uh, unforeseen uh, um, events. But you know, as you uh, uh, Anglo-Saxons say, if you can't take the heat, you shouldn't be in the kitchen. Well, you gave me a subtle hint there about keeping this meeting on time, and so I'm uh, going to take the, the cue uh, and simply uh, uh, thank you. Uh, Kyriakos Mitsotakis, Prime Minister of the Hellenic uh, Republic, uh, for this virtual uh, fireside chat, and also take the opportunity to, to wish you and your country the very best of luck in this very challenging plague year of 2020. I look forward uh, with hope that we'll be able to do this in a real space, real time way at Delphi uh, in 2021. Thank you. Once again. Keep safe uh, and hope, I hope, to see you, hope to see you um, soon in Greece. Thank you very much. Thank you.